Just use an ax. Knives aren't made to split wood. Completely improper tool for the job. See, these are all things that armchair survivalists say when their $5 Walmart knife splits in half doing armchair survivalist things. Just landed in poop. You see, nowhere in the knife Bible does it say, thou shalt not baton with knives. It says, thou shalt not baton with some knives. See that right there, friends? Is not good. So as a true armchair survivalist myself, with my scrawny legs crumbling under my survive anything survivalist pack weight, I wanted to see if I could make a purpose-built lightweight knife specifically to baton so I could leave my ultra-heavy axe at home where it belongs with the chainsaws. So because I'm just not strong enough to carry it, I wanted to see if I could make a knife that would replace both this, a small knife, and this, an axe. Can we make a knife that replaces both of these things at a whole lot less weight? Let's find out. So we've made knives here on this channel before, and I don't want to spend too much time discussing things we've already gone over in terms of knife making. I have plenty of videos on that subject already. What I wanted to focus on on this video is more of the subtle design aspects that I'm thinking about when I am making a knife, specifically or for a specific purpose. Now my steel choice here is S7 tool steel, and S7 isn't really my first choice. I just had it lying around and wanted to use it on a project. I do think that there's better steels out there for this application. S7 is a super tough impact resistant steel that is used in things like jackhammer bits, uh, dies, and other impact resistant applications. It doesn't get super hard, which we'll touch on in a second, but for the hardness that it does achieve, it's one of the toughest steels that you can get at that particular hardness. Hardness. Now edge retention is pretty low, but S7 will outperform a crappily heat treated 1095 and 57 to 58 HRC any day of the week and be way tougher. So there's that. It's just a whole lot more expensive. Now there were a couple of design elements I am trying to keep here. The first is a almost comically long but also thin for its weight, blade shape, and profile. The actual profile itself is more of an upswept trailing point. This is so that when you're batoning, the wood doesn't slip off of the point of the knife. A drop point is a no-go, in my opinion, for a batoning knife. You want that uh, either flat spine or slightly upswept spine in order to sort of catch the wood as you're batoning. The next was a relatively thin grind. I did go with a full flat grind here rather than a saber you'll find on many outdoors knives. Also, this is relatively thin stock thickness at around 140 thousandths thick or 3.5 millimeters. Now this is pretty thin for this purpose considering this knife ended up with a blade length of 10 inches with a total length of 15 inches. This is not a small knife. So heat treating S7 is actually pretty simple. We foil wrap it to protect it from oxygen and that prevents decarb from happening at the higher temperatures and longer soak times S7 requires. Put it in the kiln and heat it to 1720-ish, soak for 20 minutes and plate quench between two aluminum plates. Now S7 is an air hardening steel and it will reach full hardness by simply cooling and still air, but you can actually get a slightly higher hardness out of it using a slightly faster plate quench or aluminum plate quench. And for a blade of this length, it will also uh, help prevent warping. Now right out of the quench, this did go into a sub zero degree freezer for a redneck cold treatment. And out of the freezer, we get Ooh, 61. That's actually not bad. 61 HRC out of the quench, and then I will temper this at about 350 degrees as measured by an oven thermometer inside the oven, and we get just a touch over 60. Now I measured this several times, and I got 60 HRC after two two-hour temper cycles at around 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now at this point, I finished ground the bevel and put a temporary handle on the knife to do some testing using some of the worst stuff ever invented paracord. Ugh. It's light though. Now this knife is too light to be much of a chopper, but for what it is, it's actually not that terrible. It's actually way better than I expected at this weight. 
Now I did run some preliminary tests, batoning and some tip strength tests and quickly realized just how important a knife handle actually is. I mean, you might as well smash your hand with a baseball bat. It's probably more comfortable than batoning a knife with a paracord handle. So I think not having a handle is definitely the biggest problem with this knife. <laughs> so briefly testing tip strength here. I mean, it just pries this frozen oak apart like nothing. It was three degrees out the day that I did this. That's three degrees Fahrenheit, which is like minus 57 Celsius or something like that. And it had absolutely no problem destroying this wood. So next I threw a handle on this and decided to use some crosscut micarta with some carbon fiber pins. It may not be the toughest choice out there, but it's what I had and we're testing here. So I took the handle to 150 grit. I left it nice and coarse for more grip. I then finished the handle with something I've been experimenting for a while with now, which is Rubio Monocoat. This is actually a really good handle finish. It's better than anything else I've used before. It's a woodworking finish, but it works really well on Micarta and G10 and all of this other stuff. It leaves a really nice finish, especially on coarser grit handles. It is insanely expensive though. It's literally like gold. So be prepared for some sticker shock when you go to look at it. So with the knife finally done, it was time to go back out into the cold to do some final testing. And wow, what a difference a knife handle makes. This knife batons absolutely amazingly. It's almost like someone made this knife specifically for this purpose. Imagine that. Now, it's still not much of a chopper, so I think that it does need to be combined with something else. But what exactly? Bam! world's latest backpacking saw. Now I think combining this knife with a 3.6 ounce saw is almost the holy grail combination of lightweight and capability. Here you can saw large pieces, split wood, and still do smaller tasks, which this knife actually does pretty well. I'm not sure for the weight it could be beat for the capability you have here. And speaking of weight, let's weigh our knife and the saw. 14.4 ounces. That's without the sheath, but we'll add, I don't know, three ounces for a sheath. I don't know, we'll make a sheath and weigh it again, but I have a feeling we're gonna be right around that one pound mark. So here's a little baby hatchet. Two pounds, almost four ounces. So axes and hatchets are cool and all, but they're just too heavy to be lugging around the woods all day, in my opinion. They really aren't as efficient as a saw and batoning knife combination. Also, knives can do axe things, but axes can't really do knife things. And in my opinion, weight matters in a whole lot more scenarios than you may realize, especially when you get into wilderness areas where flying into places and hiking up and down 9,000, 10,000 foot mountains all day long comes into play. All in all, I think this knife turned out great. There are some tweaks I'd make to it though, seeing as how it isn't as bad of a chopper as I thought it was, I would make the palm swell slightly larger just to make it easier to hold on to. Also, I think I'd increase the handle thickness somewhat. It's just a tiny bit too thin for my personal preference. I may also ditch the upswept spine in favor of a simpler flat spine. And I may, in another video, see just how thin I can grind this bad boy before problems start and to see just how tough this steel actually is. But we'll save that for another video. For edge retention, this knife did fine. I sharpened this knife once this whole time and it still slices paper, no problem. I think that edge retention is somewhat overblown for woods knives in that cutting wood, batoning, chopping isn't really that hard on edge retention at all. I'm not saying it's not important by any means and more is always better, but for a woods knife, this S7 at 59 to 60 HRC is perfectly acceptable. Maybe not for cutting boxes, but that's not what this knife is made to do. Okay, so let me give you a quick cost breakdown on what it actually costs to make this knife. So first off, starting with the S7 tool steel at around $40. Next, the crosscut micarta, also around $40. Then we have carbon fiber pins, which are relatively cheap at around $2. And then shipping to get all this stuff to your house is going to be around $10. Now, I think that that's a little bit low. Shipping is probably a little bit more than that if you order just these materials. That's bulk price shipping. But anyway, we got to include something for shipping because it does cost to get stuff to your house. That gives us a total in just knife materials of $92. 
Now next off, let's take a look at the stuff that it costs to make the knife. So we're looking at belts that are going to be around $20. These ceramic belts are very expensive. You go through a number of them uh, when you're making a larger knife like this. $20 is probably on the low end. Realistically, it's probably $30. Next, we're looking at the stainless steel wrap, which is also relatively expensive. You can buy these uh, the stainless steel wrap in larger rolls, and I used about $5 worth heat treating a large knife like this. Next is electricity cost. It does cost something to run a 1,500-watt kiln for several hours. That cost to me is around a dollar. Miscellaneous supplies, including drill bits, uh, wear and tear on machines because the uh, elements inside your kilns wear out over time, uh, machine maintenance, things like that. We're going to price at around $20. That may seem pretty high, but things break and stuff's expensive to replace as you use it. You have to price this into the cost of making a knife. So this brings us to a grand total of $138 just in materials to just have the physical materials sitting in your shop ready to build. So there you have it folks, a purpose-built knife specifically for batoning. I know, it's a terrible word. I said it and I did it. Let me know in the comments below what else we should test this knife on. I'll let you decide. What should we do with it? Should we grind it thinner? Should we test it on other types of stuff? Should we torture test it? Be ashamed to ruin this, but it is what it is. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and we'll see you in the next video.